Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Thanks to MedJet for supporting the Lady Business Podcast. If you're hospitalized or your security is threatened while traveling, they can get you home. I'm a MedJet member and have been for years. Everyone who travels should be. Enroll before your next trip at medjet.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I'm Jennifer Justice. Today, we have the amazing Lydia Finette. She is the CEO and founder of her new company, the Lydia Finette Agency. You might have seen her at any one of the auctions that you go to, any of the galas, et cetera. And she was working for another company, but ta-da, she has started her own company finally. And we are so happy to have her here today. Hello, Lydia. Hi, JJ. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. What an honor. Oh, I know I'm dying. I was just waiting for it to get big enough to have you on because I know. Oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> Thank you. I will take that compliment. I mean, for double, sure. double author, best-selling, you know, known, you know, been on stages with every celebrity, you know, come on. Again, I, I, you know, I had to make sure it was good enough for you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. I'm, I've always been a fan and I'm honored to be on. So let's start for anybody who does not know who you are, which, you know, I'm sure there's in the minority, but everyone's going to love to hear your story, regardless if they do know as well. Let's start by saying what exactly you do. Well, I'm a bit of a multi-hyphenate, but I would say at the beginning of my career, I started working at Christie's Auction House when I was right out of college. I had interned there in college and then came back for a second internship after I finished college and was hired out of that internship into a full-time job. And I held a lot of different roles over my 23-year career there, but the one that I was really known for and the one that truly became my passion was auctioneering. I specialize in charity auctioneering. I'm also a commercial auctioneer, but charity auctioneering has always been since the age of 24, this weird niche specialty that I've spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours perfecting and pursuing and just trying to do better every single time I get on stage every night. And as a result of that, I've raised so much money for nonprofits. And that is really in the entire world of everything I've done, my proudest thing. Right. Um, but I've also written as a result of that job and sort of the learnings taken from that job, two books, The Most Powerful Woman in the Room is You and Claim Your Confidence. Amazing. And so when you're up, like, you know, when you first, when you're like 24, like, how did you know how to do this? Like, do you get a training? What, you know? Exactly. You get a training. So there was a tryout that happened and it was kind of a lucky thing because at the time I was working in the special events department at Christie's and the special events department is at that time was responsible for taking all the inbound requests for auctioneers from nonprofits around the country and collating them and then finding the auctioneer. And then in specific cases, accompanying the auctioneer to the big auction so that they could be the people who stood on stage next to the auctioneer and made sure that anyone who was bidding, they would record the number. They would stand in the audience. They were, you're called spotters at that point to help the auctioneer. If in a crowded room of a thousand people, you can't see everyone. You need people who are yelling bidding auctioneer, you know, the name of the auctioneer just to get Get their attention. And so that was how I really came to understand this weird charity auctioneering world, which, you know, in New York City is there are probably two or three taking place every single night. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about it before I started. And then once I saw it, I was sort of like, I need to get on that stage. <laughs> I think I need to be up there. But at the time, it wasn't something you could do unless you were an officer in the company. So you had to be, I believe, at that point, an assistant vice president or above. And I was a baby special events coordinator at the time. And then when I was 24, there was a year where a lot of the auctioneers missed the auctions. So, you know, either they 
had something else come up and they had a client visit or they didn't want to fly back or they just didn't feel like going. And so they let everyone in the company try out. And I went down for a four day tryout. I like to say it's a little bit like survivor right. Get voted on the Island day by day. And at the end of day four, I was still standing and that was really the beginning. And after that, you know, you get the basic training and then they throw you out on stage and it's sort of like sink or swim. You're either going to hate this or you're going to find something that keeps you coming back. I think a lot of people get on that stage the first time and they're like, this is absolutely insane. I don't know why anyone would ever do this. And they right. never go back. I like to say that I probably trained half of the people who work at Christie's to be charity auctioneers. And there are probably 10 who still take them <laughs> just because it takes a fair amount of you know, Teflon to get back up there night after night, especially because nobody ever really wants you on stage. But once you learn this keys of getting through an auction and making it fun, not only for yourself, but for the audience, it becomes a little bit of an addiction. Well, I can imagine it. I mean, I can't imagine that you like graduated from college going, I know exactly what I want to do, you know? No, <laughs> not at right? all. It's like, what a path that it can take you to. And especially working at Christie's, not at all what people think you would end up doing, you know? No, absolutely not. And frankly, it was never even taken that seriously. When I first became a charity auctioneer, it was always sort of a side thing that we did as a volunteer service based on what our clients wanted, or if there was a museum that had an auction and because you're an auction house and they have auctioneers, everyone just looks to you and sort of says, well, can you send someone? And so I was sent out almost nightly during this sort of gala season, just because nobody else really wanted to take them. And I was so much younger. I didn't have a family. I didn't really have a lot of friends in New York when I first moved here, because I moved here from the South. And so I felt like I wanted to have more friends and somehow going out on these stages and getting to sit at the tables, even though they were always the ones in the back with the, yeah. you know, with the, the kids seemed like a better alternative than going back to my apartment and eating, you know, Chinese food on my floor. So for the beginning was really more of a social draw, I think. And then the challenge of be getting better over time really was something that I just craved. I wanted to be good at it and I couldn't figure out how to get better because it just didn't seem to work. And then at some point my style evolved into the style that I use now, which is heavily humor-based, all about the crowd and not very much about the increments, which was the way I'd been taught. And with that style, it's been a very effective fundraising tool for me and for the, non the nonprofits that I work for. Oh, so you had this whole like arc. So you went out and you're like very serious and like yes. how you were taught to do it. And then you created your own style, which is the Lydia Finette style right now. <laughs> I don't know if it's, we all know if you've ever seen her, her, it's like, <laughs> she takes a piss out of the people on stage with her, which no one ever probably does. Cause they're usually super famous or like, you know, or to the crowd and, you know, it's pretty heavy hitters for a lot of these things. And so it's um, fun. It's great to watch. Were you always good at public speaking? Is that something that you were? I like, like drama. Yeah. I always, you know, I was a singer, but no more so than anyone else. You know, I sang in my church choir in Louisiana, which I think if you ever hear about singers, they usually sort of start with, well, I was in choir when I was young right. and then went to boarding school in Connecticut and sang in the acapella singing group and then also in the choir there. So I've always loved performance, but Charity auctioneering is almost like public speaking while people are throwing things at you. You know, you give one piece of paper that says yeah. Here are four things you're selling and I need $5 million. You have 10 minutes. And by the yeah. way, no one's going to pay attention. So, you know, yeah. even because everybody's stage, drinking yeah. and everyone's yeah. drinking and I get on stage with people all the time. And there are a lot of the comedians who are kind of on the charity auction circuit because they MC or they're kind of out and about like Seth Meyers is always one that I see out there. And he always just says to me, he's like, man, I just hate this. <laughs> like, I don't know why you do this. And I sort of, I always laugh and say, yeah, I don't know why I do it either, but I do really enjoy it. And you've seen me up there. So, you yeah. know, it's true. when I get up there, it's almost like I have this second persona that comes out when I'm up. So I'm Sasha scared. fierce. My Sasha fears. I'm completely fearless. I'm not scared of anyone or anything. I never take the jokes too far because I've also made those mistakes over the course of my career. So I know where the line is after this yeah. much time. I'll close to push. And I also am Southern. So I know the the impact of charm on people is a really right. credible thing. But as we were talking about before, like, don't mistake my charm for stupidity. My charm right. is laser focused and knows exactly what it's getting out of that conversation. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you're there for 20, <laughs> how many years? I was at Christie's. I started in 99 and I resigned about two months ago. So until 2023. Wow. It's so exciting. We have you now at this really pivotal time in your life because yeah. I did the same thing having worked in music and with Jay-Z for 17 years and then like 
quitting and starting my own. So what was that like? I mean, what were the range of emotions that you had? I know what I felt. I felt like, uh, you know, is anybody going to take me seriously or am I anything outside of this identity? You know, did you have any of those kinds of you probably Feeling. wrote a book called Claim Your Confidence. You probably didn't have anything like that. <laughs> well, I think I was lucky because in 2022, Christie's, I became a Christie's ambassador. So I'd kind of stepped back my full time role at that point anyway into only auctions because for the better part of 22 years, I had been doing two jobs. I ran a team that I started for strategic partnerships globally. And then I also had the charity auctioneering. And so when I became an ambassador, it was solely focused on charity auctioneering, which was great because it gave me. It gave me a couple of things. First of all, it gave me time to really develop the other things that I'd been wanting to do. So I started a podcast called Claim Your Confidence and allowed me to really see what I was using Christie's for and what Christie's was using for me for in a very transactional way, which up until that point, I think being in the office every single day, running a team, it doesn't allow you to really think that through. And because I had started at such an early age, I assumed that everything I did was because of Christie's. And I realized, and I think I had been coming to this realization before the ambassadorship that the nonprofits weren't coming to me because of my time at Christie's. They weren't coming to me because of where I worked. They were becoming to me because of the skill. And the, it is a one-of-one -one situation in terms of what I have created with this skill. I've been doing it solidly a decade longer than almost any other auctioneer that I've trained out of Christie's. So I knew, I knew what I had. Mm -hmm. And so when I became an ambassador for the company and I realized, I remember the day that Robin Hood, the nonprofit in the Northeast that's in New York, it's the biggest nonprofit in the U S reached out to my personal email to ask me if I would take it. There was no mention of Christie's. There was no mention of anything except are you Lydia available? Mm -hmm. And I remember going back to them and saying, listen, I'm an ambassador for Christie's. So I could take it on behalf of Christie's or not. And it was kind of like, either way, we just want you on stage. And that was about two months after I became an ambassador. And that was one of the first times I remember thinking, maybe it would be better if I actually just did this on my own. Mm -hmm. And then over the past year, I've had some really interesting conversations with other organizations who call and are like, listen, if you weren't a Christie's ambassador, <laughs> these are it's such an interesting conversation to have when you're working for a company. And someone's like, but if you didn't do that, think of all of these other opportunities. So for instance, you know, if Sotheby's was sponsoring it, we could still have you there because you don't work for anyone, you work mm -hmm. for yourself. And I remember when I posted that I was leaving Christie's, the ambassadorship and had sort of told them that I was leaving a friend of mine a year before, right when this whole thing was happening, when I was becoming an ambassador, they said, you know, it's interesting. Someone had given them the business advice that as long as you're playing on someone else's chessboard, you'll always be playing by their rules. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. And I don't know why it stuck with me. It just, I kept thinking about it. And I remember in February, I got nine calls for auctions all around the country. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, I, I have to create my own chessboard. Mm -hmm. Like I can't be a Christie's chessboard or a Sotheby's or a Phillips. Like it's not this, there is a white space. And I know this business inside and out from both sides. I planned these things with events at Christie's. I have been the auctioneer over a thousand times. I know what, I, I know what this looks like and I know how to do it. And if I can't do it, I should be training people who can do it as well as I can do it now. Right. And that's really how it all started. And that was what made me take the plunge to start my own agency. Um, and kudos, congratulations. It's amazing. I know it is it's so true. It's like, you're always playing by somebody else's rules and it doesn't matter. You could have the best idea and be like, tell them and they're like, yeah, we're not going to do it. I remember I left my company after I was at Rock Nation, I went to Superfly, as you know, and we, um, I was recently, you know, I'd given them all this advice toward the end of my um, contract there. And they were kind of like, no, you know, and then uh, somebody else came along and gave them a bunch of money and told them the exact same thing. And they did that. Right. And when mm -hmm. I talked to the, the one of the owners after that, he was like, you gave us all the right advice. We're just like, well, this person paid me. So now I have to listen to him. You know what I mean? We're paying yeah. you. And I was like, that's so crazy. So I was like, you know what? I obviously have great advice to give. I'm going to do it but it's on my own terms. And then, you know what I mean? It, it's like, it's, it's different. Right. And so, but you still have all these other things now, now, instead of Christie's, you know, asking for the money and all of that, you know, was somebody else negotiating the terms of them or are you still negotiating when you're at Christie's? No, I mean, these were nonprofits. So with yeah. Christie's, 
they were always volunteer right. opportunities for people to take care of. And about 10 years into my career at Christie's, I remember the head of HR at the time, I had trained him to be a charity auctioneer. And I finally said to him, I was like, listen, I have to stop doing this. I am out every single night. I mean, I have donated 10 years, 50 to 60 auctions a year, sometimes a hundred. And my husband, it was actually the person who sort of sat me down and was like, okay, something's got to give here. You have yeah. a full-time role. You're not being compensated for this. So I sat down with him and I said, listen, I should be able to ask nonprofits if they will pay for my time, if my company will not. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to donate my time. I love donating my time for the, for the organizations that I feel passionate about, or if there's something that Christie specifically wants me to do. But if someone who's coming to me that has absolutely nothing to do with Christie's and nothing to do with a nonprofit that's in my world, I should be allowed to ask for payment for that. And he was like, yeah, no, I agree with that. And I'll never forget. I mean, again, 10 years of volunteering all of this time for this. And I remember asking for my first organization if they would pay. And the yes was so fast. It was like, it almost felt like a slap in the face. Like, I know, what have you been doing? Like, how could you yeah. not do this? But it had been so ingrained in me that this was something that I should volunteer my time to do. And what I've learned and what I've realized over the past 10 years, and often when I talk to nonprofits, what I say is you as a nonprofit are looking to the person who's on stage that night to raise your operating budget for the next year. Mm -hmm. Like, Why would you ever want anything less than the absolute best on that stage? Yeah. At the end of the day, that's the only person who can make money for you right. at your event. It's not the florist. It's yeah. not the person who gives you the venue. It's the person on stage and a yeah. good auctioneer as you've seen in New York city, the difference between a good auctioneer and a bad auctioneer is 30 to 40%. You know, yeah. it's the difference between a weatherman that somebody knows who happens to like being on stage versus someone who's been doing it for their entire career. Yeah. So in other words, pay for the flowers, but, um, you know, we don't have the don flowers donated, but pay for the auctioneer. <laughs> right. Exactly. We were talking about something before and I was trying to get at a little bit, but it was, it's like, you know, that, um, now that you're on your own and you're negotiating these things, and now you really are hyper-focused on what your value and time is worth. Right. In particular, as a woman, when, yeah. you know, our wealth gap is 32%, our pay gap at most, you know, uh, you know, at a minimum is 80, like most in the forties. Right. Um, you know, how to negotiate for yourself and get what you deserve, right? which is really hard. It's even hard for me as a lawyer, you mm -hmm. know, I think there's a saying, anybody who represents themselves has a fool for a client, any lawyer that represents himself has a fool for a client, you know? So <laughs> it's like, you know, I even have lawyers when I'm negotiating for something for me, yeah, um, which I love. <laughs> and, uh, and I love negotiating on behalf of other people who are super scared about negotiating this. But now it's like, you know, we were just talking about how, you know, you're going to be kind, but you're not going to be nice. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I said, I think we were just to even back up for anyone listening right now, what we were talking about specifically is the lessons that you learn working for a corporation. And I'm from the South. My mother is British. I've always been taught to be polite and to be accommodating. And I think you can be those things, but you can often make a mistake when you have those as qualities in your life, because people are never afraid to take advantage of those qualities mm -hmm. in someone. Oh, you're polite and accommodating. How much more can I get out of you without ever giving you a thing back? And an interesting thing about a corporation, which I've always said is, and my father used to say this to me all the time, you are what you negotiate and not a penny more. And so a company will pay you whatever it takes to get you to walk in the door and not a penny more. Mm -hmm. And if you say you don't want to do something and you do it anyway, well, then you've shot yourself in the foot. Exactly. And I think I did that many times over the course of my two decade career. And when I started to realize how many extra things I was doing for a lack of compensation and would bring it up, it was not always well received. And so what I've realized now in these new roles that I have, and there are so many different elements and parts to my job. And what we were talking about is what I've learned is and I feel like I say this very honestly with anyone that I work with, I'm like, I am very nice and very kind, but don't mistake that for a lack of savvy. Like mm -hmm. I know exactly what I want from you and I am mm -hmm. going to ask for it. It might be with a smile or a nice email, but at the end of the day, don't take advantage of it because the advantage is taken of, like I'm done yeah. with it. So yeah. moving forward, like be on, be alert that this is the way that this works moving forward. And I have no compunction about asking for what I deserve because I've spent so many years on the back foot with that and have learned my lesson. So yeah, let that be my advice to anyone listening. And yeah. And you know what? And you can always reset, right? It's like, 
certain people, it's like when you stay at a place for so long, like I did, you know, and like you did, they, they start to just go like, oh, they're not going to ask for things. They're not going to yeah. do things. So I try to train the women that I'm talking to that are going to, that are in corporations. They're like renegotiating their deals or, you know, mostly when they're renegotiating deals, I'm like, look, if you never asked and negotiated on the way in, they are not, you know, what do you think that does to them psychologically? They're thinking, oh, okay, well, I can get away with everything, right? Because you yeah. never, uh, you never like advocated for yourself. Right. So you have to do that going in. It also lets them know that you will advocate for the company. Yes. So, you know, if you're trying to then get what you deserve, because now you're in a C-suite role, you can't get that all in one deal. It's going to be right. very difficult. The way you're going to get it is to leave. And so you always have to be prepared to leave if you're not going to get what you're what you really want, you know, and you can reset those things, but it's really hard if you don't set that, you know, tone and pace and know what you are worth and what you deserve in the very, very beginning. Yeah. And I think the one other thing that I will never forget is a friend of mine was one of the early founders at Google. Like she was one of the sort of first 20 in. And I remember her saying to me over drinks one night, the difference between me never working again and me having a nice life happened the first year when all the guys I worked with went in and asked for equity and mm -hmm. I thanked them for the raise. Yeah. And I think about that all the time. It never feels good or I take that back. It can feel good to ask for more, but you need to do it. Yeah. And you also have to think about it as a reward for yourself for making sure that you're staying on the same level as everyone else. Because if you don't ask, you're never going to get and exactly. that is the bottom line. You get 0% of what you don't ask for. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. So she's one of the first 20 people and she said the difference between never working again, never again and having, having a nice, a nice life. life was right. the first year she did not go in like many of her peers yeah. ask for equity. She yeah. just said thanks for the raise. Thank you. Which we always that. do. We're like, we're like, oh, no, we're so happy to be there. But it's that's, yeah. that's going to stop for all of us. Those yeah. times are over. <laughs> yeah. But again, I think it can be done in a way that feels very relevant to who you are. And that's the most important part of all of this, that you feel like you're walking in strong in your own words, and you're not trying to be someone that you're not in these negotiations. Because a lot of times I think that's where we fall short. Like it's hard to walk into a negotiation being a total ball buster if that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. So how do you phrase that? How do you frame that? Think about that before you walk into any negotiation. What are the words that you're going to use? What are the things that are going to feel comfortable coming out of your mouth? So that the person sitting across the table is not like, wait, who is this? Who am I talking to? Because that puts everyone in an awkward space. Right. What was the inspiration for your first book? Let's talk about your books a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote the most powerful woman in the room is you, because I felt like there was always a woman standing next to stage waiting to tell me how much she hated selling and how she could never sell anything because she hated when she was rejected because people were rejecting her and not the item that she was selling. And it was this litany of negativity and after hearing that for so many times, I remember thinking, as I said to you earlier, I'm half British, half Southern. Those are not cultures where women are taught to go after things and be loud and aggressive and, you know, and I'm none of those things, but I can hold my own on stage. So how did I learn to do it? I learned that most of that had come through auctioneering. And I realized too, that if I could learn it, that I could teach someone else how to do it. And so mm -hmm. that was how the most powerful woman in the room is you became a book. And then when I was on book tour for that book, I just realized that everybody was asking me about confidence. Mm -hmm. How are you so confident on stage? You seem like such a confident person. And so I started writing at the beginning of 2020. And I don't know if you knew that the global pandemic was coming. I did not see that coming. <laughs> um, that, was real, that was a real curveball. And <laughs> when that happened, I didn't write anything because I was homeschooling children and trying to keep my team intact around the world. And also, you know, eating peanut butter crust as part of my school cafeteria worker mm -hmm. job that I also picked up at that time. Yeah. And so I didn't write anything. I mean, I was like barely getting by like most yeah. people. And then towards the end of that year, I realized that I was getting so many DMs and questions on LinkedIn about confidence. And people would say like, I lost my job. I don't have confidence. I mean, I took a 40% pay cut. My husband lost his job. You know, we were in total just, oh my God, what is going on? Our entire life in New York city seems to have imploded overnight. And are we staying here? What are we doing? There were just so many questions. And I realized if I was struggling with that, then pretty much anyone I knew was probably in the same boat. And I just started writing again. And I wrote in my second book, Claim Your Confidence, about that experience, about the world shifting around us. 
and the ability to stay confident throughout that and what that took and what it took to really get our family through COVID, like many of us with different stories. And so that kind of became a couple of chapters. And then ultimately it all came, it came, it all came out. Amazing. What do you want women to take from, or anybody who reads it, what do you want them to take from Claim Your Confidence? What are your like three top whatever tips that you want them to know? I really want people to take ownership of their life. Mm -hmm. I find so many women asking other people what they should do with their life. And I'm looking at them thinking, you're the architect of your life. Why are you passing this off to someone else? So that would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is, if you think you're going to get more confident by playing safe, I don't think you realize what it takes to be truly confident. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is step outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Make a choice, do something that makes you scared. And when you get to the other side of it, you will realize you're so much stronger than you had any idea. And that can be said both mentally and physically. I mean, as you know, my family was in a horrible car accident on Halloween of 2021. And last December, my husband has a titanium wrist as a result of the accident. I have a titanium spine and we were all in, we were in California. And I remember saying, I think we should go um, surfing. And my husband's like, it's 50 degrees outside. Like it's a weird California thing. We live in New York. He's like, I'm not a surfer. I'm like, I think we should just try it. And he was scared. I could see he was scared. I hadn't surfed since the accident. And we went out in the 50 degree weather with our kids, you know, two instructors. And we took a beating and we were in the water freezing and stayed in there for two hours surfing. And I was shocked at how much I was able to do, even though my lower spine now has a rod and I can't really bend it very much. And my husband was shocked at how much he could do, even though he has a titanium rust and can't really bend his wrist. And so it was just one of those things. And I remember saying to him afterwards, like, this is why I do these things. You know, I test myself so that now I know I can serve and I'm not going to be scared of it next time. And the same thing with skiing, like all of these things that I'd always loved to do before the accident, I didn't do because I was scared that following year. And I was like, I can't live my life scared. And now every time I do one of those things, I become more confident in my ability to do other things as well. And that is definitely something that can be said for anything you do in your life. So I get comfortable with the uncomfortable, you know, make sure that you're thinking about your own life and what you want to take ownership of. And the final thing I say in the book is empower your positivity, take ownership of being a positive person. Mm -hmm. Remember that that's not only for you, it's for people around you too. Like if you right. can't, if you can't feel positive and good for yourself, look around you and think about the impact that positivity makes on the people around you every day of your life. Mm -hmm. And don't ever underestimate that gift that you can give to other people. So those three things have always fueled me through life. And that positivity fueled me through a really tough recovery after the accident. Um, anytime I would go into the negative, I'd be like, you can sit there for a little bit. Don't stay there. Yeah. It's a it's sad. It's okay to have those moments, but yeah. don't wallow in it and don't sit there in self-pity. Yeah. get up, keep going. And right. again, that was a really huge lesson for me about life and about the way to live your life. Yeah. It's like, um, you hear any like a therapist that talks to about like recovery of, you know, in general, you know, if something bad has happened, it's like, you, you know, it's okay to have those feelings. You can yes. ride that wave, but then make sure the recovery is quick. Like yeah. acknowledge those feelings because everyone has them, yeah. whether it's jealousy or resentment or any kind of negative feeling and it's okay. And it's fine. It's totally human. And the people who say, that's why it's like, there's this thing called toxic positivity too. Cause that can be, you know, just as, as jarring on you if you, without acknowledging that you can be down yeah. sometimes it's okay. It's totally fine. It's just making sure that you have that recovery and the recovery is quick. Right. I love the phrase. My sister uses it a lot. You only know the ones because you know, the tens and you only know the tens because you know, the ones meaning that you only know the highs because you know the lows. Yeah. You know, huge crier. I love crying. I think it is the most <laughs> cathartic thing. It's totally genetic. And if you are with my mom, my sister, and my daughter and me at a movie, we all burst into tears at exactly the same moment and then can't stop. And it's, it's borderline hilarious, but I've always felt like, and I say to my daughter, when she's upset about something, I'm like, it's okay to be sad. Like sadness yeah. is an emotion, just like happiness. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think when you allow yourself to feel that, as you said, and, and even during the accident, I would have moments where I would be like, this is really tough. Like this is 
painful. My children were hurt. My husband was hurt. Like we were in a bad shape. Mm-hmm. Then I would think to myself, but look at this community of people that have risen to be here mm-hmm. when we're going through here and going through this and how they're helping us. Like think about what they're doing to make us get back to zero. Right. And so there's always something, there's always something that can help you along. And I don't mean that if you have true mental health issues, but I think for most of us who are living the day to day with a normal reset, that is a possibility. And it is a wonderful way to live life. Yeah. Well, you know, going through now, what you had, like, you know, going to your own business, right? Yeah. It's like such a change. Like yeah. you're, you had this, you know, job, then you were an ambassador, but it's like, now you're a hundred percent relying on you. Right. So yeah. how has that, I know it's only been a couple of months, but have you seen the ebbs and flows of what so many female founders talk about, you know, in general about being scared? Like, have you, have you had that roller coaster of emotion yet or not yet? <laughs> Something to look forward to. It sounds like, you know, I feel like, <laughs> as I said, this past year was kind of a nice launching pad for me. You know, I had the books, I have the podcasts, I have all of these other things. And I will say that I've always believed and have always seen, even in my own business at Christie's, which I started the department. So I felt like I had kind of an entrepreneur's job of an entrepreneur. One thing that I've always felt very strongly is that action leads to action. So whenever I get scared, whenever I feel like something's not happening, I'll sit down and be like, okay, so what can you do? We were talking about keynote speaking, right? We're both keynote Mm -hmm. speakers. And what do you need as a keynote speaker? Places to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So- how do you get business? You can either be like, come on universe, send me some business, or you can do what I do and tell every single person you meet that you're a keynote speaker. This happened to me recently. I was in an airport coming back from an auction in Los Angeles. I was in line at Delta and these guys came running up and they were kind of running late with their bags. And they were sort of like, uh, I was like, you're going to be fine. Like go to this person, go to this person, you know, and they ended up behind me in line and we're going to check our bags. And as we're going through the sort of four lines to get up, to check our bags, they were like, so what are you here for? I said, oh, I'm here for this auction, you know, and I was telling them all about the really fun auction the night before. And then we kind of went around the other one. And what else do you do? Well, I'm a public speaker. I have these books and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we talked through the four lines left, you know, never thought I would see or hear from them again. One of the connecting points was that one of the gentlemen had a Southern accent. And I said to him, are you Southern? And he said, yeah, I'm from Louisiana. And I said, oh, I'm from Louisiana. That's so funny. And we talked about that for a second. Anyway, never told them my name, anything. About three weeks later off of my website, I got an informational interview and um, it was one of the gentlemen who I'd met at the airport. And he is the head of PR for a massive law firm. And they are hiring me to speak at their partner's retreat next year. Amazing. So I say, you know, people are so good about putting in their earbuds and ignoring Mm -hmm. the world around them. Every opportunity in life is an opportunity to network. So don't just close yourself off, especially in a place like an airport where you could be traveling for business next to someone who's traveling for business, like a quick introductory, hello, never hurt anyone. And if you get into a conversation, don't necessarily shut it off until the, they know what you're doing and you know what they're doing. Cause you never know where there might be an intersection there. That I've never heard anybody say that in my life. Cause usually people are in an airport, like just, I want to get in, I want on the plane, yeah. I want to get out. I want to talk to anybody, you know, I barely want to talk to, you know, the people letting me on the plane. So um, that's really funny and it's great. And it, and it is good. It's like, you know, stay open, stay curious is always, you know, in life in general and like building your career. If you're going to just be closed off, you're never going to learn anything anymore. <laughs> and um, you know, you know, Desiree Gruber, right? She always yes, talks, yeah, she always talks about, you know, she's very organized and a planner. And so she, um, night before she's planning her next day, she writes down something. It's like her kissing her frogs, you know, and it's like things that she doesn't want to do like on a list, but she's got to do them by a certain time, like 11 o'clock, or she's just not going to do them. You know, that's a great idea. I love that. I will definitely steal that. But it's the same. It's like being able to like, when you're feeling down and like, you know, gets action, you know, you got to put those things out there. And then, you know, when you start getting them back, that's when you're like, oh, okay, right. This is going to be yeah. fun. This is going to be yeah. fun. Well, and I'm glad also- that you haven't hit those ebbs yet. So yeah, I think I'll probably just action my way through them so that I don't hit them. <laughs> That'll be annoying <laughs> for the next podcast. I can tell you all about that. Um, no. And I, you know, I think the other thing I will say, and one thing that I've found, especially with people who haven't run businesses before, you know, I feel like with strategic partnerships at Christie's, I had a 12 year run with that. What I thought strategic partnerships was going to look like when I walked in the door and launched the business 
was nothing like it looked like 12 years later. It was completely different. It changed so many times. There were so many evolutions. And at the beginning, I remember being like, but that's not what I thought it was. And by year six, I was like, well, let's see where this goes. And one thing I always said to people, they're like, well, what if, what if it fails? I'm like, first of all, who would ever know if it failed? It's my company. I write the narrative. Exactly. I write the story. Yeah. So this could be the best thing that ever happened or not. Like, no one's yeah. ever going to know because I'm never going to tell you if it's going badly. I have <laughs> a storyline. So just know that. <laughs> Lydia Finette Agency will always be successful. <laughs> um, but the second part of that too is when it's almost like public speaking, people are like, well, what happens when you mess up on stage? I'm like, who knows that you mess up? Yeah. You let go of the things that don't serve you at that moment. If it doesn't work, just move in a different direction. Yeah. That is the evolution of a business. If something isn't working, it doesn't mean you're failing. It just means you just drop it and try something new or move in a different direction. Mm-hmm. You know, when I did a masterclass during COVID, I did, I launched it because I lo- I'd taken a 40% job cut and all of the auctions that I was being usually charging for were gone overnight. Yeah. Um, so both of my business streams had basically dried up overnight. And I was like, I need to get creative about what I can do here. And I was getting a lot of questions about four topics, sales, negotiation, networking, and public speaking. And those were coming in, just people were bored. I mean, it was COVID, everyone was inside. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm watching all these people launch online classes. I'm online all the time doing auctions or whatever it is. I know how, I know my way around a camera. So why don't I just launch master classes and I can do 90 minute classes for you know, $200 a person, 25 people. It's the size of a zoom screen and drop them like sample sales. Like Mm -hmm. Sunday night, let's talk about sales. You know, the next Sunday night, let's talk about negotiation. And I would do the class four days, four days later. And the first time I dropped the sales class, it sold out in two hours. It was like, I couldn't keep up with all the, you know, the people coming in. Same thing happened for all four in the first month. So I did those four classes. So I was like, well, this was a wild success. I guess I'll do it again. So the second time I dropped that sales class and people signed up, but it was like a three day, four day thing. It wasn't fast by any stretch of the imagination. And I think I sold out of those master classes over that month. But then the third time I did it, like half the class signed up the first time. And I remember saying to everyone, well, half of the class was a buyout. That's why you guys have 12 people in this class. Yeah. That was not- no one had bought out the other side, but again, put the positive spin on. Um, but what I realized pretty quickly was that I'd saturated my market. All yeah. the people who wanted it were done. But the interesting thing was I was getting a lot of random requests. So people would ask for the videos after the classes. So I started selling the video and I was like, you can either buy the video or you could buy the video in a half hour consultation. Mm-hmm. Then the half hour con- consultations turned into coaching. So yes, the master classes that was modeled eventually failed. Do you want to use the word fail? But I think that it evolved because- but Don't tell also- anybody. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm telling you guys because no, and I can't stop talking. So, but my point is eventually it all, be, it all came into coaching and coaching is, you know, one thing that I really enjoy doing until now, because of all the things that have happened this year, I no longer have time to do coaching, but it was enough to get us through COVID. And that yeah. was the, point. Yeah. um, and something was learned every single time, which was great. Yeah. Amazing. You have so many great nuggets. I mean, I, when, I, when we first were starting, I was like, what do you have to like five o'clock? You know, it's been, it's been three <laughs> no. hours since you don't yeah. know when we started sure. recording. But um, I know that, you know, unfortunately I do have to let you go because you do have this, you know, company that you started and <laughs> you have a thousand emails over just this last hour. Um, but what I do want to ask and what I ask every single um, guest on here is what is the worst advice you've ever received? worst advice I've ever received. Oh gosh. Um, probably just, you know, when I remember asking for a raise early on in my career and I would get sort of pat on the head with a, you're just lucky to work here. Oh. Yeah. And that wasn't like once that was many, many times. Oh. So oh I'm not even sure that was advice. It was just, and I remember thinking, yeah, you're right. I am. So I guess I won't ask that question again. But you know, do you think or know if the men were given the pat on the head too? I don't think so. You know, I can't be sure because I never asked that question, but yeah. that certainly wasn't what it felt like. And it certainly wasn't what it 
seemed like when I found out that I was making a third of what I was supposed to be making in my job 10 years into my career. Yeah, that's nice. That's always nice to find out. Unfortunately, yeah. that happens far too much. And uh, I have to hear about that all day long, but we remedy it as much as we can. Um, so thank you so much for this. This is There's so many great nuggets in here. I know the audience is going to love it. Um, I also want you to say how people can find you when they want to hire you, want to be you, stalk you, buy your book, you know, all those things. <laughs> All those things. So I am active on Instagram at Lydia Finette and my website is lydiafinette.com. The books are The Most Powerful Woman in the Room is You and Claim Your Confidence, which can be purchased on Amazon. And I have a podcast where I interview successful women at the top of their game called Claim Your Confidence. Um, the podcast is called Claim Your Confidence with Rockefeller Center. So tune into that and listen to that wherever you find your podcasts. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Taking Care of a Lady Business. Until next time, I'm Jennifer Justice.